Myrna Manson Norris, cultural attaché of the National Quail Council, and you are watching Belizean Legends. This is Belizean Legends, and I'm Bilal Morris. Today we will be speaking with the legendary Myrna Manzaranis from the Belize Creole Council, a outstanding Belizean citizen that have lived and encompassed both worlds, living in the Belizean diaspora in the Los Angeles Belizean community between the years of 1970s all the way up to the 1980s, and then Myrna migrated back to Belize, repatriated back to Belize to continue her dynamic work as a social activist, a Belizean that had been involved with organizational activities, a Belizean, a pioneer that had built this Los Angeles Belizean community that was one of those people that was very instrumental in building what we call here the Los Angeles Belizean community. And later on migrated in repatriated home to Belize where she continued to work as a social activist, educator, and one of the prominent activists and speakers and representative of the Belize Creole Council. Myrna, my sister, we welcome you to Belizean Legends and it is an honor for us to have you on here today. Well, thank you very much and I am glad that I'm a legend. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you surely, you surely, you surely are. Um, Myrna, the reason why you are a legend in your own right. You are a very important Belizean after your immigration out of Belize, I guess in the 1960s? Well, no. out of, I came to the United States in the, in the, in the 1960s mm -hmm. and have lived in the United States for a period of how many years? I lived here for 25 years or so because I went back in 86. So how much is that? My math isn't good. Very good. So you also lived for 25 years, then went home in 86, mm -hmm. came back again, right? No, I didn't. You never back. did. I that was a time when you re when you repatriated back home in to Belize in 86. Right. And so you have been here, that's 30 something years mm -hmm. since you have repatriated back, approximately 31 years mm -hmm. that Myrna Manzaranis had repatriated back home to Belize. And you have never returned back since. To live. I've been back almost every you have year. Never, yes, you have returned I mean, to visit, I, but you have never returned back and given mm -hmm. up and say, I can't deal with Belize, I'm going know. back to America. No, no, no. When I got to when I got to um, Belize, I went the year before to see what it was like and see what if what I was going to do if I decided, you know, I was going to stay. And I realized I was going to teach at the teacher's college or any, anything like that. But when I first got there, I didn't do that. I worked at the Peace Corps. And then after that, I worked with teacher's college. Then I, I also worked with University of Belize. But when I first came back, I brought my eight-year-old daughter. And what I had in my house was Hurricane Lump. I was living in Butwood Bay, but we didn't settle in yet. Yes. We had hurricane now, and I have to wash my clothes. Pasco board and things. board. My daughter loved it. Wow, wow. She loved she it. She loved that culture. She, she wanted the hurricane now to be there and whatever, but I just needed to do it till I got in my light. After she got there the first day, Juliet Samaranis was still alive, and she lived right next door to me. Her son, Polly, and my daughter, I didn't look for my daughter the next day. I can't find my picnic. She's in the drain checking out tadpole. <laughs> <laughs> the girl had found her culture. <laughs> I will tell you, but anyway, but that was really nice. And so I never had a problem. I never felt like I wanted to come back to the United States. Um, I was home because being here, even though I had my own home, I gave up my home, I gave up everything. I had my own home, I was working with the U.S. system, I was a teacher in the schools, but there was something missing. I grew up in Malante, in Diaspora, a very cultural village. And so I just didn't feel 
right everybody was having a good time but not me so when I decided to go home everybody ah you can't go home blah 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 but guess what I felt so good I had come home that's pretty good the pretty girl son and the pretty girl daughter has returned back to her culture. <laughs> exactly. And then when I first got home, I worked with Peace Corps. The guy that hired me, he liked me because oh you were very much into your culture and stuff. He wanted the Peace Corps volunteers to to um to get a piece of that. So I worked with I worked with Peace Corps. But you see, working with Peace Corps, I had to do a lot of traveling. So every time I would go to the United States, I had a green card, and every my whole family had a citizenship. I said, I'm not giving up my citizenship, yeah. you know. So working with Peace Corps, the, the traveling and everything, and every time I passed through and stuff, they always give me a hard time because I passed in through and blah blah blah. I said, Why one day I get back? So I say, I keep on a damn bridge, yeah. <laughs> I you give it you give it away right there on the spot. The whole right life. there, second in a damn green cat. I was serious. Yeah. I mean, I'm working with Peace Corps. Yes. And I'm traveling. I'm working with Fidel people. Yes. And they couldn't give and me that. And then you still want to give and throw See, the throw the laws after you. Me, they home. Yeah, they home. Yeah, they home. <laughs> there you go. They don't do that to Fidel Peace Corps. Why they? So, uh, you are there helping the Peace Corps. Exactly. Make accommodations for you. I gotta. I gotta. Um. A piece in my book also about that, the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps. Yes. Wonderful. We want to cover those things. Uh, we have a lot that we want to touch on. America, <laughs> you brought the books. And we want to take our listening audience to our, our viewers to see this incredible body of work that Myrna Munzaranis has been able to compile over the her years of, re, of uh, repatriating back to Belize. Again, this is uh, Belizean Legends, and I'm Bill Almars, and we are speaking with the legendary Myrna Mandaranis from the Belize Creole Council. Myrna, we want to go straight into your work with the Belize Creole Council mm -hmm. because um, it just did not just start there when you went home. You've been doing that kind of work from Los Angeles, right? And maybe you have been doing it before you even came to America, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm a Miguel boy. Yes, as a person who a uh, uh, black Creole woman. Yeah. Because you know, Myrna, a lot of people wear a curl and one they will like the word black. When we say black or African to our people, we, we, we tend to wow, like, don't call me that, I'm a Creole. And, and, and we want to sort of get some kind of understanding about that. Why do you think that is the case, Myrna? Well, number one, we are black. Yes. We cannot, I mean, you just look for me. And black, it's not really the, the skin, you know. When we are talking about black, yes, we have we are from the black race, but when we are talking about black, when we are talking about Creole, it's a state of mind, you know. I am Creole, and automatically, I know I'm black, but a lot of Creole people are black. Yes, yes. A lot of Creole people are mixed, and they're not black, mm -hmm. and that is okay too, Very you know. Much. And so I like the fact that I can call myself black for my African ancestors. That is my connection. Yes. Okay. Yes. And so I don't have a problem with being black. I mean, you know, I think I'm beautiful. There you go. <laughs> As you bad used to say it, right? Black is beautiful. That's right. right? I don't have any problem with, <laughs> with who I am. Yes, and yes. that is the problem that we have. People yes. have a problem with who they are. Um, they have a problem with their own concept of self yes. and even within our family. Yes. Um, sometimes you have different shades within the family. And then they leave black one. Mm -hmm. They will say they leave black one, or because you black, I didn't, you know. So. so that was never an issue for me. Yeah, you see here coming out of our parents' mouths and our grandparents. Exactly. You know, they have this, these uh, prejudice racial overtones that they learned as exactly. Creoles growing That's up right. in these societies. And they, they learn those things, and nobody in this teaches the children that it doesn't matter what color you are. Yes. It is who you are inside. Yes. Because whoever you are is going to shine out. And so whatever color you are, it doesn't matter. Very Look, you know where I went to school? You know, when I came over here, I was accepted in two universities. Cal State, UCLA, UCLA. and Pepperdine. I went to Cal State for one day. And while I was 
I mean, sorry, U.S. translator is later. Mm. UCLA. I'm sitting down there and looking around at all these students and the professor is all the way, way up front behind a podium and hundreds of students in there. I, I couldn't deal with that. So I decided, well, I'm going to go to the smaller school. So I went to Pepperdine. Smaller, less people in the classroom, but close guess what? Huh? Very formal and close knit. Yes, community. but guess what? It was a Christian college and all of that. Yes. But when I look around, hardly anybody looked like me. <laughs> There's not a lot of black folks. Yes, yes. And my friends became the foreign students. And one girl from Jamaica, and, and one girl from Santo Domingo. And the Jamaican girl, she was Vilma Charlton, she was the, the um, she ran, you know? Mm -hmm. And like a top athlete in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So those are our friends. Mm -hmm. But still it, you know, I, I, I was black, but it didn't matter to me. I wasn't thinking about you white and you black, mm -hmm. till it was pointed out to me at that school, Americans can be very prejudiced. Very much so. You know? Very much so. Very much so. So, so you learn a lot about prejudice and racism in the United States. In the United States. That's right. And this is the thing that they are saying, Bernard. We see the writings of Evan X Hyde in the publisher's section in Amanda that is saying, why is the easiest trying to say that racism was not in Belize? Racism was in Belize. We came as slaves. Black people came That's there right. as slaves, as African slaves. And he's saying today still that there is still racism, but it's hidden inside classism and so on. Talk okay. about that if you may. All right. I think I am perfectly right when it comes to the class. It is the classes that we look at because you have people who are the higher class or the whatever. They are maybe sometimes the people that are the lighter skin or what have you. And they didn't want everybody to know that they had a black person in the in the in the, in their in their um house. She was black, but they weren't black. But this lady was kept out of. They loved their grandmother, but then they didn't want to show her up because she was black. Stuff like that. And that was a long time ago that those things happened, you know. And so, believe you had a different level of classes. The, the class, some of the classes had better, they did better. Uh, the middle class, they were the regular, and so they make a little bit more money, and the lower class, you know, don't do as well. And so you tend to look up to these people. Well, I am sorry. Yeah. I the formal antique. Yes. I <laughs> <laughs> An open pocket. You could say that again. <laughs> I don't look up to nobody yeah. Yeah. because they think they're better than me. And from I was a little girl, I was a fighter. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to fight. I don't care who yes, you yes. are. Except it was a pride about your culture, about your I race. You weren't ashamed of it. You were proud of it. And every race that we know, we boast about Belize is a multicultural society. And our Mestizo brothers and sisters, they are proud of who they are. Their Garifuna brothers and sisters are proud of who they are. Our East Indian brothers and sisters, right. and even the Mennonites, right, who are a mm -hmm. Caucasian group, are proud of who they are. Mm -hmm. Why can't we Creoles, uh, so called Creoles, and I put that in quotes, who are black and African people, be proud of who we are? I think they're getting mixed up. We, yeah. we are, I, there are a lot of um, Belizean Creoles that are proud, but there are a lot of them who feel like if they're called Africans, because you know, when you say African, oh, you're the top of somebody down there. Right. There's nothing wrong with Africa. We are Africans. And I could remember using that same term about Africa. Me yeah, no Africa, me no come for Africa. Yes, yes, yes. Do you understand? Yes, very, very common thing. Yeah. Who taught us? Mm -hmm. It is our colonial masters or whatever that taught us that we get this thing that because we we black, we that's something I know the black people, they didn't do so badly with the black people. Yes. But when we start to call ourselves Creoles, yes. because the Creole now is a mixture of the white man mm -hmm. and the black, mm -hmm. and they well, can, we use a call Bakra. That's right, mm -hmm. and they get become that is what made the different shades in the Creole culture. The Creole culture is not black anymore like it used to be. We have Creoles that look nearly look white. Yes. Do you understand me? And you know Dr. Strong, Dr. Jerome Strong, who is a 
Belizean sociologist that got his PhD from USC. He said that Bilal to me one time, we have had some very, very, very detailed conversations over the years since 1998 when he got his PhD. And he said to me that a lot of Belizeans, they look like Spanish, but they are Creoles. Exactly. He said this word Creole needs to be explained. He said exactly. Belizeans don't understand much about that word. That's right. As we know it in the Spanish language, mestizaje means mixed blood, you know, mm -hmm. that's the word Creole. Mm -hmm. But he was trying to say that a lot of Belizean Creoles don't even understand what the that's word right. Creole means itself, right. um, beyond the mixture of white and black. He says that he can show me a lot of people, he said like Manuel Esquivel, the Prime mm -hmm. Minister, he says, though he looks mestizo, he's cruel. I said, no, you're crazy. Yeah, what would that be? <laughs> right? He says, yes. And he began to break down the anthropology to me. Right. And so I said, man, you know what? A lot of all people are very ignorant of this. That Our is a problem. People are so very ignorant. I don't that speak about that if you may. All right. Uh, I think th yeah. that, is, that is a big problem. And, I, and um, let, me, let me just go back with the, with the, with the Belize Creole. The Africans came. The Africans were here. And the Africans were different tribes. Do you yes, understand me? Yes. They didn't speak each other's language, yes. and it was and and. But the only thing that they spoke, they had the same grammar. Same grammar. That's right. Yeah. And they didn't couldn't understand the, the the English man, the white man. Yes. And so what did they do? They started to use the Afri the English words, around the grammar, of the Africans and that's how we came out in the first instance with our language and there are certain words that we cannot say mm -hmm. you know we, we don't call people um, I, can I use a, the, the example of the yes go right ahead all right go right ahead we are open back here now right now Caribbean the African because of the way that they spoke could not say Caribbean yeah. they say Caribbean, yes. right? And piece? then when the Caribs were called Caribs, they couldn't say Carib, they say Carob. Look at that. And that was not a derogatory word. Interesting for you there, Belize, pay attention. That was not a derogatory word. Yes. And we used to call the, the, the Caribs Carob. But it was not something bad. Yes. And it's the same thing with the Spaniard. Now the Spaniard they didn't have as much problem with when we say Panya like the Garuna would did when we say Carol mm -hmm. because the, the, the African could not say Spaniard they had Panyard oh, and then the RD became a problem <laughs> so it's uh, a so Panyard the syntax in the, right. in the whole vocabulary and the, the vo the, not the vocabulary but the alphabet of the African languages you said they all have that common uh, alphabet and syntax so that's why they couldn't say certain words exactly. and why certain words came to be so the panyard yeah. because they were our panyard i mean you know it became panya uh, yeah. and so that was not a problem and even today many times they did the, the, the is, is it the same thing with the word coolie no the coolie yes i hate that word you know why yes that was a servant Oh. In India, it was not a, a language no, a problem was, that the Africans had, but it was just no, given no. to them by the British slave masters. The British called oh, the, okay. the 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 the, um, the Indians mm -hmm. cool because they were they were Indian, and the person who worked in the in the houses they were servants. So coolie, that servant, yes. you understand me? And I used to always I always tell. My friends that were East Indian, my gosh, you know, one of them are coolie, yes. one of them East Indian. Yes. But then they just didn't, you know. They just didn't know. Yeah. They just didn't know. But now, yeah. they have a better understanding of what coolie. So they know that coolie. How the word came about? They know where the derivative, derivatives, yes. Okay. And the English call him coolie. We don't know where they come with that from, but yes. they were East Indians that didn't. Then I'm just servant and they call him Kuli. You see, so that is different. And then with us now, our oh, carol, because of the guttural it's sound, that, it's just like the Chinese. Mm -hmm. But we're not getting into trouble with this one. Uh, no, you the Chinese don't. Here, no. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I believe in curl, yeah. That's yeah, right. Open pocket. The Chinese don't People say. People believe in legends, open pockets are open pockets. All right, pocket. all right. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the Chinese can't say rice. What yeah. do they say? They say rice, no? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't yeah. say rice. They uh-huh. say lice. Oh, lice. So R is a problem for them. Look at that, please. Interesting, very interesting. But we're gonna look at that. Yeah, yeah. You see to them. Yeah. They say lies. They say lies. Uh, it's, right. it's all about language and linguistics and how certain ethnic groups pronounce or say certain words. Exactly. And we, we misunderstand them that they are cursing or they are teasing or giving a derogatory way of saying certain things when exactly <laughs> that's just the way how they, they they say the word exactly very very much this is Belize and Legends and I am Bill Hal Morris and we are speaking with the most informative exactly. legendary Myrna Manzaranis and um, I would add that sister Myrna Manzaranis here from the Belize Creole Council bringing to us a great understanding of the Creole language its derivatives okay. its, its history from the whole African experience, where African slaves were brought to, where African slaves were brought to Belize from Jamaica, talk about that, Myrna. They said that the Belizean black Africa, the Belizean African slaves, they actually the British brought them out of Jamaica. Is that really so? Why I, I'm not sure. I'm not going to say anything that I'm not sure about. But I know that when the the, the Africans came, they came to Barbados, but other than places in Jamaica and what have you. So I don't think they came directly to Belize. They may have come to Jamaica, you know? And so that- Barbados or through some of the- Right, because they came to the Caribbean Caribbean, and then they came to Belize, you know? And even, even back then, you had the free blacks, you had, the free blacks were able, they were not slaves. And with those free blacks, they, they could do, they could own land and what have you and own different things. But the slaves, they could not own those things. Not only that, you find that hmm, when back then, say for example, when we did go to school, we could speak our language because they couldn't understand half of our language. Do you understand me? Because we created our own language. language. We created our own language. Creole is a language that was created out of that experience. Yeah. And Creole is a language. It is not a dialect or anything like that. It is a language and it is recognized throughout the Caribbean and through the the, um, language institute or what have you. It is a full-fledged language. And because I could teach you the grammar, I could teach you everything. We have a dictionary in Creole, you know? Mm. So it is a full fledged mm. language. Talk about the dictionary. How did it come about? <laughs> well, that's through the Creole Council. It was me, Sylvana Woods, Yvette. I Yvette last name. And then we had some, um, we had some um, linguists that were down here. Two sets of languages that assisted us with it, and everything. Dr. Calvin Young, the Governor General, did he make any input in there as one of the foremost scholars on the? the well, he, language. Didn't, he wasn't. Um, as a matter of fact, in the book, he made he did the. What do you call it? Preface. He wrote, yeah, the preface, preface to that book. Preface. You understand me? And he yeah. knew what we were doing. He, he was in university, at the university, I think, at the time, as the president. Yeah. But he was cognizant of everything that we were doing. Do you understand me? It was consultation with him. Yeah, and in the, terms of exactly, yeah. and the, the dictionary. I mean, everybody buys it. People buy it in Creole. Wow! Look at that. <laughs> that is a very important thing, Myrna Manzaranis, because we hear how the African Americans they speak a, a kind of English they call Ebonics, Ebonics. and uh, they are now saying that they now have they they have to have a dictionary and a Bible. And even in all different te- in all different religious texts in the African American dialect, because African Americans speak a whole different English. Exactly. It's the same thing with Belizean Creoles; they speak a whole different languages. One of the things that I was very shocked and it about is not English. Yes, it is not English. One of the things that I was very pleased about, as you touch on that point, on the on the, on the fact that you you know there is a Bible. 
in the just the New Testament, uh, just the New Testament, the 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 the, the New Testament, uh, in the which is the Gospel. This is the Gospel of mm -hmm. Jesus in the Creole right. language. That's right. And one of the things that I was very touched about when I after being out here for like thirty years and taught at EPR, I was going around the classrooms at EPR and hearing some of the teachers teaching Creole. Exactly. And I was like. So I had a friend of mine that was a math teacher there, so he used to do it a lot. But I thought that, well, we come out of that English-speaking experience, English. and teachers and educators are to be teaching in the, Creole, in the English language. So I asked him, I said, why are you doing that? He said, man, they understand better. Exactly. And he's right, it is true. It, 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 it is so true that if you are not teaching children in the language in which they grow up, they, they will not learn better. Your heart language. Very, I, very much so. Right. I went to you know, University of Southern California and I did English as a second language and I got the teaching credential, lifetime credentials at the University of Second, uh, 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 Southern California. So when I went home, when I worked with my teachers, that is one of the area that I worked with them and the teachers that got me as teachers as they, their, 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 their teacher will know and they use that concept that the child comes to school with a language mm -hmm. you the teacher knows English and lang English and, Sp and Creole so what you need to do teach the concepts that the children need to learn mm -hmm. in the heart language mm -hmm. then you teach English as a second language yeah. Yes. You could have your class for the day. This time is only English. Mm -hmm. And that's all they talk mm -hmm. then. But when you're giving them the concepts that they need to know, you got to tell it to them in the language mm -hmm. that they understand. Mm -hmm. Because the teacher do it in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And there's a school in the, in, in Dambriga, uh that is doing it with the Garifuna now and too. Maya. And the Maya. Why? We started a Creole. We started a school years ago and Belizeans were the ones who you know because they thought Creole was bad and Creole was bad bad English that's what they taught us to believe yeah, yeah, yeah. but I want people to understand Creole and I know bad English yeah, when you look here <laughs> you could be talking English and having a good time I want you a good joke what happened <laughs> Creole <laughs> yes it, it, it comes over better exactly. because a lot of the time you are talking to people who are of the Spanish language I had a conversation with a Cuban and we are listening to the, I love Spanish music mm -hmm. most of it I don't understand the language I understand a lot of Spanish mm -hmm. but me and him we are sitting around and we are listening to these awesome salsa and he's looking at me and he's saying you like the music but only if you understand the language I said but yeah I understand some of it but I love the music yeah. he said no he said but you can't really explain in English what Spanish is saying he said, you, he, said, he said to me, you are not really getting the beauty of the, 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 the song because I can't explain it to you in English, he says. You, you have to, you, only, so you see where the, only certain things are able to be explained properly in that language. Mm -hmm. If you try to move that thing out of, <laughs> into English, it, the whole meaning changes. Exactly. The whole meaning, and I know that for a fact with Arabic, you know. Um, and it, it is so right, Myrna. It's so important that you are here today and sort of give us some understanding of the Creole language in terms of educating our children. And a lot of times we fault the children why are they not doing good in the PSC, Aye, why are yeah, they yeah. not doing good in the common entrance, exactly. why are they not doing good in this and in that when they need to be able to learn it in the language that they speak at home. I remember and we call it the language of the heart. I remember I had a school a high school teacher, Mrs. Satchel, I'll say her name. Ah, Derek's mom. And then you still said, mark up my paper like this every minute. Fourth form. And he said, I am not hitting the, the nines out of the tens, I'm hitting the six. Sometimes to the bottom of the fives. And I would go to her and I said, Mr. Satchel, why? He says, Denton, I want you to wait at the end of I want to talk to you. And you know what she said? She said, who speaks English at home? I said, nobody, Mr. Satchel. Everybody talk real. Yeah. He said, I want you to start to read books. 
He said because you are writing Creole in English. <laughs> <laughs> that that happened because I taught English at UB. Yes. That happens. And today I reflect on that bird and I'm like, the same thing African American kids do. As an educator today, they are writing in bullets in right. English language. Exactly. <laughs> so they have to know this. So I go back language. to my experience and and she said, and you know what? From she pointed out to me, where it was, I started to catch up in my grammar. And I started to do better. Mm-hmm. But that is a big problem today. Our children are writing Creole in their languages. But look, I have and I saw it at DPH when I taught again. Mm-hmm. My foot farmers were doing it. But at the Did university? Yeah. At the university? Look at that. They were writing Creole and I had to make that, you know. And at the university to, level? I had to tell you. <laughs> and I said, my goodness, can finish high school and at the university, but then what they are writing. They have queer words and they don't know how to put it in English. Yeah, yeah. Because English is not their first, first language. language. In Belize, yes. the only people that English is their first language is the British, British. and maybe some of the Americans. Very but important. Everybody point. Say else. that again, Myrna. Please say that again so they look at the camera and say that again. English is not the first language for about 99 or more percent of Belize. The British and maybe the Americans. English is their first language, but it is not the first language of our Belizean children. So we need to teach them English as a second language. Give them the concepts that they need to learn in the language they understand and do English as a second language. Otherwise, they're not going to do well. And they're not doing well. They're not doing well. This is no. what has resulted in the why we see these these low scores in inside the PSC mm-hmm. and then we they are blaming the teachers they are saying teachers got it gone and these teachers can't even pass but the, the teacher they can't even bleed me well the teacher they are going to learn from the teacher fail the exam and prepare the tech so uh, um, they, they did something I remember they did in Belize where they let the teachers take a certain test to see if they can actually teach the teacher uh-huh. and the teachers failed Miserably, right? So we have a serious problem there. That's right. Oh, when you go back and you look at the level in the 60s that people like yourselves came out of, the high level of education, the scholarship passes, the high level of A levels of Cambridge GCE, the, that breed of Belizeans. Is not no more. Look at what me. has. I had asked a Belizean journalist, international journalist, Lennox Samuel, I said, Lennox, you have exploded in the world because of your SJC 6 form. I said, is it the British educational system that has resulted for you to have excelled so great in the world as an international journalist, as master? He speaks with a British accent. Where did he study in Korea? Right? He said to when he went home, Belize and said, You could talk real? He said, Why did you ask me? What are you assuming? I can't talk real. <laughs> but he said, That's, he said, That's, he speaks with a British accent. If you hear him, he speaks with a British accent. He says, But ask him, Was it the education that have resulted for you to become what you are today? He said, No. It is our upbringing. Okay. My father said, Keen him once for coming in second. Hey, what? Because he's a fuck. He's not coming So you come first. <laughs> you see? He's a guy, he's a, he said he was a brain power. He, 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 couldn't, he never had to study, but he was just his brain power. He said his father came in one time. He said, I got caned for coming in second. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about that. Why is it then that the Creole language was so highly spoken then? But apparently that breed of Belizeans mastered both the Creole language and the English language, the Queen's English and was able to comprehend all these examinations that was given from Cambridge University. Give your spin on that. Why do you think it's, it was different then than it is now? Why is it that we are having these low passes that we weren't having then? We were having the same problem with the language. No. But I think that the people back then, we, we read. Yes. We read. These children nowadays do not read. They do not read. We read. Now I remember they told us, I could remember at home, 
we talk our Korean. But at school, you only spoke English. Yes. At school. Yes. And that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. But then there was a time you couldn't talk Creole at all. Yes. And I think that is where people start to things start to backfire. Mm -hmm. Because they put down your language. Yes. The bad language, that's whatever. Mm -hmm. And so people start to, to um what do you what's the word I wanna say? They get back. Without even knowing it. And so they're not a Lego feeling crew. Well, I went to school in the US. Mm -hmm. I went to university here. When I got on the bus, honey, <laughs> all I <talk> <laughs> Yeah, dude, you're, and you hear them on the bus. I mean, Los Angeles was like the mecca of the language. You want to hear Korean and feel at home. What we on talk about, everybody knew what she won. Yeah. Huh, and I, I remember a joke. I was going to LACC one time at the bus in the It was 1983. And a, and, a, and a guy, a, a Latino dude got on the bus and he he, he, he blew gas. And I heard a Belizean lady say, he needs orchestra. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because he stuck up the whole bus. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, that's the one Belizean that's right there. That's so you could have been hearing it though. That's right there, you're calling it. You know, and I think, I think we rebelled. Because they tell me language bad. Yeah, yeah. Don't be yeah. talking that bad language. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, that is yeah. not a bad language, that is yeah, my language. Yeah. I am from Gales Point. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And we talk Creole. Yeah. But Gales Point is an Af was an African community. Very much so. We practice some of our African things in Very that village. Sure. And they said it was the high rights all the time in these historical analysis that it was the site of one of the slave rebellions. Yeah. In that year. Because that's what we did. We, 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 you know, we got down there and then we just do what we wanted to do. Yes, and yes. I loved being there. Yes, yes. Because you couldn't get there. Yes. You had a trouble getting it there. It was like a maroon. It is like a the maroon Jamaican community. maroon society at Belize at that right. time. It was it's a maroon community. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, we were away from the... And so we live in our own world, and that was a great world. I, yes. I loved it. Very much so. Because and then Sir George, he, his father was very much into the boat. That's into the, the, the late Chief Justice, George. Sir George Sir Brown, Brown. That was my very good friend. We grew up together. And uh, they had taught all the children to, to sail the boats and stuff. But before they sail the boats, what we used to do? Mm -hmm. Get the coconut horse. Take out the inside, get the coconut leaf and pull out the straw out of the leaf, yeah. get paper, put it on each side, and that became our sale. Yeah. And as young children, that what we go sail in the lagoon. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. We go and we sail those things in the lagoon. Yeah. But that was fun. It was fun. You know, yeah. and I couldn't so imagine a child fun. just having right. fun like that. Yes, indeed, indeed. They're learning the culture. It's socialization that they're learning the culture, the culture is embedded. Today we find both Creole, Mo Garifuna is saying, and I heard Mr. Palacio did this in the 1992 Black Belizean Summit at the University of Belize, extramural department, and she said about her culture. She's half and half. She's half, you're right, she said that. And she said that the, 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 the language that was coming out of the mahogany camps, this cross culture pollination mm -hmm. between Garifuna and Creole. Mm -hmm. That today we are asking ourselves, we hear on the Palacios' great journey to help save the Garifuna language. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with the Garifuna language, as Garifuna, the, the Garina group, is saying is that they are losing the language because the children are talking Creole. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, there is this mixture, this cross culture pollination between Garifuna and Creole. Where Emery Palacio was saying when she was doing the census, you asked the, you asked the picnic, who do your pa? Garifuna. Who do your mom? Cool. Or oh, vice versa. Mm -hmm. So he said, you would ask them, who are you? Me. <laughs> so he said, where are you going to put on the census? Yo, how you do you count? You must put other. <laughs> <laughs> so she was just making that one point yeah. that the two people are so much similar from the Mahogany camps where Garifuna were quoting Creole men, Garifuna Creole men were quoting Garifuna women through the drums and the language of the drum. Mm -hmm. That both African people understood the language of the drum. 
but we are looking at this now where one one African group or black group in the country say that they are losing their language because of the Creole. The children are talking Creole. Oh, that you're an Talk about that. Dog. Why is yes. this happening? Well, I think that the children feel comfortable talking Creole. And the reason why, because like it's the dominant, the past, the dominant language in the country. In Everybody in China yeah. talk real. Exactly. Yeah. Because they say, we, we, I, I will never forget this experience. I went to the Chinese and I was asking something and the mommy said, He said, you talk English, we talk Creole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will really never forget <laughs> that. This is and really the Spanish <laughs> Chinese <laughs> man, he said, you talk English, we <laughs> talk Creole. <laughs> the language is, the, is, is very dominant. Exactly. But what happened, I think, that um, the children, when they go to school, because they are not the dominant culture, they are around a lot of Creole children. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the language they're going to talk is a language, you know how children are. And so with the they Central American long. refugees that came to Belize through the United Nations High Commission, right. that uh, UNDP, 40,000, now these second, third generation, I talk some of them on EP York and mm -hmm. then they talk real. Right. They, and they're, they, they're establishing their Belizean citizenship. Exactly. They're saying, you know, I'm Belizean. Me, I Belize. Yeah, so yes. we're the Chinese. Yeah. But you see, these kids, they, they talk real because they feel comfortable. Um, and if they talk their own language, no, they don't do that when they talk Spanish. Why? Because yeah. Spanish is more of an international yeah, language right. and they could yeah. understand that. Yeah. So the picnic in Spanish could be talking to your friend and turn it down and talk to you in a yeah. Creole. So they do the same thing here in America, stuff. they are bilingual. You see? Yeah. And that yeah. is a, that is one of the things that we have to we have to make sure that happens that all of our children are bilingual. Bilingual, very much more. Not only that they could switch, but the fact that if you're bilingual or trilingual intellectually you do better. Yeah, you better. Is this going on with all the ethnic groups, the Creole, Garifuna, and the uh, Mestizo? Where the Mestizo. Maya, all four groups. All of them talk Creole. All of them talk Creole. But they but have. Look their, like they are having problems for them talking the original language. The Creole is wiping out, you know, way okay. their languages. And what has happened is that they, at home, the, from the, the parents will talk to them into their language. Okay. Once they drop out of the door, they learn Creole. And I talked to I talked to the parents and talked to a lot of people and tell them, you need the children need to learn both languages. Don't you know? Let them speak to you in Spanish at home. Cause they talk to the parents in a Creole. Yes. Parents understand what they talk, you know. Yes. Grab the languages and feel good about it. I had an interview about I don't know two or three months ago. And she was asking me well, the same question that you mentioned. Person is half Creole, half Garifuna, yes. or half Spanish, or um, and then you have half. East Indian and Garifuna mix and all that. And East Indian and, and uh, all the different. Yeah, the so they want to know well, how do you identify yourself? I said, let me tell you something, honey. You identify yourself how you feel comfortable. Okay, really. If I feel more comfortable. Being a Garifuna, then I am Garifuna, mm -hmm. and I could go around and I learned both Creole and Garifuna, but I am Garifuna. Look at look at Myrtle. Myrtle is Garifuna and Creole, mm -hmm. and she more fits in, you know, as the as the Garifuna culture. And I don't like the word Gao, Gao, or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. And she understands the dynamics of what is going on. Exactly. When I hear her lecture at the 1992 Black Belizean Summit, mm -hmm. the Minister of Golson and Mr. Nemhar, she was one of the speakers. That way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she yeah, she she yeah. she identifies. She knows where her Creole and her her Garifuna is, and that is okay. And if you want to be more Creole than Garifuna, that is okay. Yeah, but in it's terms of the census, how do you count these children? I will count them who I am, yeah. because sometimes they have other. Okay. I don't want to be no bloody other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see, you create a problem that I was talking about it to Dr. Durham Strong and he mentioned, yeah, that could be a problem because then how do you count? And that's what he felt that a lot of 
Belizeans, the, the saying that Belize was once a predominantly black country. It was. And it's no mestizo. He said there is some mis... The, it's not some, mestizo. Yeah, okay. he, he was saying that there's some errors in terms of the census because he don't feel like it's the, the count that they give, 25%. He feels that it's not that. He feels that it's higher, but they are not counting them mm -hmm. because of the census. Mm -hmm. And this, 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 this whole cross culture pollination that is going on I in know, that country. I know. And they, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because, like, for example, the guards on there are only like 2 to 2.5% or right. something around there. And they are getting miscounted also, and like they, what they, Palacio was saying. Yeah, the, yeah. the um, Mayas. They're even less than the Garifuna people. Yeah, now the mestizo is higher, but you see, a lot of the mestizo are the people that came, came from the Central from America, and Central and America. 19, so 19, 19, they should, they Central American refugees. That's what they should put on the center. Yes. Central America. Very much, very much. Not mestizo, whatever. Yeah, and put that's Central, right, Central America. America. That brings me to the question to you, Marina Menzoran, is that a lot of Belizeans in the diaspora are complaining that. But um, Belizeans of Guatemalan heritage, who has become naturalized citizens of Belize, that have Belize. more rights than natural born Belizeans that live out here in the United States. And this is what they call the Seventh Amendment. That the Belizeans who are natural born Belizeans, their rights were taken away from them in the Constitution How? by when the Prime Minister of Belize brought up the Seventh Amendment at Parish Hall. That there were a group of Belizeans who actually went and and knocked down, so to speak, the whole aspect of natural born Belizeans that live abroad that they should not have the right to hold political mm -hmm. office. No, yeah. I, I Whereas they are saying that Guatemalans and, 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 and even American expatriates mm -hmm. who come to Belize have that right. Yes, yes, because yes. they have become natural citizens and they feel that it is unfair. But you buy no citizen. Yes, so why is it that you take away my right? Because I live in LA, Chicago, New York and Florida, no, yet you give the Guatemalan the, the speak about that. You you okay. you'll you have the um, past two words that I wanted <laughs> to because it's a hot issue right now. No. They're quarreling from between abroad and at home about the seventh I amendment. Think. If you are a born Belizean and you get naturalized, that is a problem that people are seeing because they think you have to give up your Belizean citizenship yes. and become an American. Yes. That is the problem. Yes. Do you give up your Do you hold on to and, and then there's a lot of them are saying abroad that um, the Guatemalan don't have to. Let's let's stick a pin there, Myrna, and we're gonna come back. This is Belizean Legends, and I'm Bilal Morris. We are talking with Myrna Menzoranis about the Creole culture, the diaspora, and reparations. We'll be right back. <laughs>